How are you doing? Good. Doing great today. Hair's looking fabulous. Yours too. Thank you. I, I, I feel like we got a good hair situation going here. This is, this is healthy hair. Awesome. This, is, this is head and shoulders written all over. Awesome. Yes, absolutely. You should have an, do you have any kind of hair endorsement deals? No, have you ever had? I'm thinking that's, that's, I'm way overdue for that. Let's do this already. With all your entrepreneurial stuff, I'm kind of surprised because I learned a lot of stuff from the movie listening to Kenny G and we'll get into it, but I'm drinking some Starbucks right now. Okay, thank you. Didn't even plan that. That's just like something I do. And I, like uh, on top of all the other success you've had, you were like in on the ground floor of Starbucks. That's a pretty good investment situation there. How'd that happen? It's a very good investment. Um, you know, I'm from Seattle and fortunately for me, Seattle was where Starbucks started. And they had one store and it just sold coffee beans. And it was very famous for having this great coffee. My uncle called me one day and said, hey, I'm going to give Starbucks some money. They want to expand. You should meet this guy, Howard Schultz. And I think you guys will be friends. And I think you would uh, be good to make an investment here. So I met him and I thought, wow, this is a really uh, charismatic, smart, capable guy. This guy is uh, and great and a great guy. And I thought, well, um, he's going to be successful. So uh, that's when I gave some, some of my money into there and, uh, yeah, it did really well. I'll think of you every time I drink my blonde roast from now on, but yeah, much. keep going, keep it, keep it coming. <laughs> but yeah, get, definitely a great investment, but I learned a lot of things from the film, but I guess I'll just dive in because there's one burning question that needed to be a- asked that the director, oh. Penny Lane, she she right in the cold open of the film, she says that uh, basically she realized that you're I'm paraphrasing, but that your success in music pisses a lot of people off that people get angry about it. And she kind of wanted to explore why on earth that was the case. Do you think that this film not to do the spoiler alert, but do you think the film answered that question? Oh, I think it, it answers it all, all like many times. There's a lot of there's a lot of critics in the movie that voice their opinion and it's not things that i haven't heard for the last 40 years so for me of course when she's warned me about it when she showed me for the first uh copy she goes i gotta warn you about the first 15 minutes of the film and it was very kind of her to do that but when i saw it i went penny you don't have to warn me i've seen this and heard this for decades and hasn't hasn't changed my opinion about anything yet were you at all wary to agree to sign on for a project knowing that, you know, that premise, I guess, would be kind of unavoidable in a film about you? No, I, I again, I'm comfortable with it because I've experienced it myself and Penny and I discussed it. So I knew we were on the same wavelength as that. She wasn't out to like show to get me in the film. Right. She was out to show that there's two sides. And I go, great, show the two sides because I know I know about it. So. I don't have any, I'm not fearful of it at all. Well, here's the awesome thing though, is as you mentioned, the first 15 minutes of the film are kind of laying down the premise that you've gotten a lot of flack over your career. And they do have a lot of like jazz historians or scholars or critics who aren't being super kind. But then as the film plot twist, as the film (laughs) continues, you start to see them, maybe not everyone, but certainly some of the talking heads in the film kind of come around. Yeah. They start to dissect it almost like they're doing a, a, a thesis or a class on you and start to sort of see the appeal almost in real time. You're seeing the, the yeah. wheels in their brain. Like, tell me about, you know, that must have felt, you know, maybe you don't lose any sleep over this kind of stuff. But like, that must have felt good. That must have felt vindicating. It did feel good. It, it, it felt good. It also brought a smile to my face. And, and the audience also laughed when they start to actually put out a few compliments, knowing how strongly they felt before like in, in the earlier part of the movie. So yeah, it, 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 was, it was nice. It was, it was, um, I, I was happy for them because I felt, I felt like, Oh, they're going to, maybe their lives will get a little bit better if they can embrace my music. It's going to make them happier. I'm sure. <laughs> you're absolutely. Yeah. You're doing, you're doing, you know, some good work out there, but, um, <laughs> well, I, it's funny because, um, how, how should I put this? Like, Basically, you seem very self-deprecating the film. You seem very at at peace and and cool with your place in pop culture history as I speak to you now. But isn't there any part of you that would, you know, I mean, I imagine there must have been at least some moment in your career when 
even though you were having a lot of commercial success, that the critical acclaim was evading you that, you know, it, at least maybe early on that kind of hurt your feelings. It would hurt me if, I, if, you know, someone was talking smack about my writing or my ability on camera. I mean, you know, even if I like was like, oh, it's fine. You know, people talk about you doing something right. There'd be a part of me that would be wounded by it. No, not with me. No. <laughs> What's your secret? What is your secret for this like rosy outlook and like Teflon coating you've got going on? Well, it's just, it's the secret is a lot of reps of all the good stuff. A lot of reps make, makes me, makes you strong. You know, yeah, I got lots of reps of people telling me how good I am and not just people, but people like Miles Davis and, and uh, George Benson and great musicians, Stan Getz and people saying that they enjoy my music and, these are legitimate jazz people. And so I got re lots of reps of that. I got lots of reps of me playing in clubs where people are reacting to my music. I got reps of standing ovations. I got reps of playing with Liberace and Sammy Davis Jr. And I got reps of doing all sorts of things. So yeah, I got pretty strong. And that way when somebody says, hey, I don't really like what you're doing, I'm going, and? Why, why would you be here? <laughs> True story. <laughs> Why would I even, what, what, is that going to supposed to change anything that I'm doing? No. Plus Actually, the, big, the big rep is inside. I know that I'm doing what I love, doing it the way that I would. I have an instinct about the way I want to play my saxophone. So when I do it the way that I want to, and I, I release an album and it's the music that I want to release, it's like, this is beautiful. Oh, I don't like that song. Okay. Well, I still think it's absolutely great. Beautiful. So, so that's, that's the way it is. I definitely want to ask about that, about the, the new standards album coming out. But, you know, to piggyback onto a couple of things you said about fans you had, like something else I learned in the film was you're Bill Clinton's favorite saxophone player. And he was a right. sexy sax man. That was kind of what he was campaigning on. Like, did you have you ever jammed with him the way he did on like Arsenio Hall or anything like that? Have you ever like had a sexy moment with him? I did. Tell yeah, me we, about that. We had a sexy moment. <laughs> It was while he was campaigning, he came to LA, he was still governor. And I got a call from somebody and uh, hey, uh, you know, Governor Clinton would like to, to come down and do a duet with him at his fundraiser. So I decided, well, am I voting for Bill Clinton or am I not voting for Bill Clinton? Because mm. I won't do it if I'm not voting for him. And I decided I was going to vote for him. So I said, okay. So I go down, we get in a room and he walks in and I'm, I look at him and I go, what do you want to play? I mean, I'm like, what do you know? He opens up his tenor sax case. He pulls out a piece of music, slides it across the table. It's my song, Songbird. <gasps> and I go, I know this one. Let's do it. <laughs> I know it. We'll be fine. Good thing <laughs> for you. Yeah. Right. So it worked out really well. I actually have a picture of him and I jamming together in my home that I look at a lot. So it's, uh, it's, it's a nice memory. And since then, you know, we became friendly enough and um, I played probably another three or four or five private things with him involved. I went to the White House and played at one of the state dinners. I slept in the Lincoln bedroom. I've done a lot of things. Nice. Awesome. Very nice. The other thing I want to bring up, because you brought up Miles Davis. I don't even think this is in the film, but every once in a while, the meme, the photo, it's circulate. I'm sure you know, there's a photo of you and Miles Davis together and he you look happy and he looks just kind of like very hostile or intense yeah. in, a, in this photo. Yeah. And it gets circulated. I actually saw it just the other day. People just love to send this around or post it as some kind of evidence that he's like not a fan of yours. Ah. But, you know, like like it's a moment where he's glaring at you. Yeah. But I would love to hear the true story behind that photo, because apparently he was a fan. That photo was taken backstage at Lincoln Center when. I was his opening act for some concerts that we did, not only there, but other places. So I was his opening act. That picture happened when in between two shows, he sticks his head into my room and he goes, hey, you play that song. It's all songbird. I like it. <laughs> it's good. I go, thanks, Miles. Can we do a picture together? And then somebody was there and that was the picture. So that's just the way Miles looked at me. He wasn't looking at me like he was mad because he had just given me a compliment about how he liked what I was doing. So there's the, there's the whole thing. So when they when people show that picture, I remember that picture because that's when Miles actually said to me, "I like what you are doing." Wow, there's a great stamp of approval right there. 
Absolutely. I'm so you don't even know how happy I am to have gotten the story. I get this. I have the definitive story because a meme or photo out of context or whatever can, all, you know, people I'm so happy. I have the two story. I cannot wait to run with this. This is Better. awesome. Run, run as fast as you can. <laughs> I mean, I just, you know, I literally just got it, saw it on Facebook like two days ago. So like here, ever I'm going to shut everybody down when this, when this, well, I'm the one that provided that picture. Cause it came from me. I mean, I'm the only one that had that picture. I'm the one that put that out into the, into the world. So I'm proud of that picture because, you know, yeah. If you look at it without the context, it does look like he's glaring at me, but I think miles just, I think he just glares. I think that's his vibe. You know, it's like, don't read, don't read so much into it. He had resting glare face. I think he had resting glare face. <laughs> at least when he was, his eyes were open and looking up at you. I think that's just his resting glare face because he was not unhappy to take the picture. He's, he was cool. He's the one that came into my room. I didn't, I didn't want to bother Miles Davis. You know, I'm just la glad that I was his opening act. So I just kind of mind my own business and doing my thing and play my set. And he's the one that came and found me. So awesome. That is in incredibly awesome. That is really cool. So you're talking about how you play just the way you feel. The movie Listening to Kenny G kind of has a little bit about that, you know, sort of in a scholarly way, dissecting, you know, whether the fact that you're more of a soloist than a, um, jammer or whatever but how did you come about with your style particularly i'm interested in the whole circular breathing thing like you know i don't imagine you in, invented that but it, you sort of pioneered or spearheaded that technique right well um gosh you know i just always wanted to just play songs the way i want to play them and so when 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 you want to do that you kind of have to be the front man you kind of have to be the lead guy and you have to kind of have the songs the way you want the songs to be so if you're going to be in a, a band and you're just going to play your part and then everyone else is going to play their parts and it's going to be more of that kind of a, a collaborative thing, that's not going to let me do kind of what I want to do. I really need the space and the control. So that's why I like doing the music the way I do it, which is me playing my melodies and then impro improvising the way that I want to with the music the way that I want it. So I'm in control of it. That's, that's, that's how I hear it. So that's why I do that. How did I develop my sound? You know, it's, one of those things I'm honestly, there's no way to, to describe it. It just is. When I first time I picked up that soprano, that's the way that it sounded like. I had my own sound, couldn't change it. Try, I tried to sound like people that I had heard, but it was just always my sound. So I'm lucky that way. It turned out to be a good thing. So that's just that way. And I, now I just practice every day to just to be, become a better saxophone player. I still practice three or four hours every day, have for 50 years practice this morning. I'll practice tomorrow. Okay. Every day. That's how it works. I'm surprised by that only because, you know, with the number of years you've been doing this and, and obviously the, the huge amount of success you had, it wouldn't, I wouldn't think you would need or feel the, feel the need to practice. I probably would be just fine if I didn't practice probably, but I'm not taking any chances. I want to always be on top of my game. Also, I want to know when I'm standing on stage or performing wherever that I've done everything I can do to my, be my very best. So knowing that I put my practice time in and my three or four hours, that seems to be my sweet spot. Sure. I could practice eight hours a day if I wanted to, I could practice one hour, but I found a sweet spot in between three and four hours. That seems about the right thing for me to get where I want to be and still have a life. So I still have time for other things. Otherwise I could just practice all day and not do anything else, but that seems to be my thing. And then um, the circular breathing I saw, uh, some players do it on stage when I was in high school from a group called the Jazz Crusaders. And they did this whole, they hold this note and I saw their cheeks kind of moving. I figured it out at home. And then I practiced it for like 10 or 10 or 12 years before I tried it in front of anyone. And then when I did it, people were, were kind of went crazy because I wasn't just holding a note. I was doing other things. I was doing riffs while I was circular breathing. And so I think I kind of took that circular breathing to maybe a, a level that most people don't, which is, can you just keep playing your lines and your scales and circular breathe? Doing one note's pretty easy, but can you do it and do all your riffs without losing the time and the tone? And I, I can, because I've been practicing it now for like 40 years. So yeah, it should be pretty easy. Do you still hold the Guinness world record for the longest note? Sustained I, note? Don't, I don't know. I, I don't know <laughs> if I do or not. I'm still thinking I do, but I would feel you. Who would beat you? Well, I'm sure there's people. I mean, there are people that could probably beat it. Um, I don't. I think at this point, it doesn't matter now. I think I don't think Guinness records are that 
they're not that special now because we have the internet now. So everything's kind of out there. Before yeah. the Guinness thing was like, whoa, what's happening on the world that we don't know about that we could never find out unless we look at the Guinness, world, Guinness Book of World Records. Um, if it's important, I can, I, can, I can probably hold a note for like an hour and a half if I wanted to. It's been, I think my record was 45 minutes. So, but I can go way longer than that if I wanted to. I just haven't felt the need to punish myself. <laughs> but, but if I need to, and it's important, I'll do it. All right. Fair enough. Um, so you talk about, you know, how you practice so much. And in the film, you talk about your perfectionism. You even talk about how your perfectionism spills into other things. You make yeah. a joke about wanting the interview you're doing on camera for the film to be the best interview <laughs> yeah. ever. I hope you're feeling that way about this one. I hope Absolutely. the pressure's on. But you, it's the same feeling. I, honestly, the same feeling. I want to be as I want to be as sharp and perfect as I can for you. Well, thank I'm you. So so far so good. I appreciate that very much. I, I'm wondering though if this if perfectionism though tying into the stuff we were talking about that's addressed in the film about you not always getting very much critical respect and even some downright critical scorn. If that perfectionism comes from wanting. Like if people are going to already be in a position to criticize you or go hard on you, you better be better than everybody else. So that you don't leave them room to do that. You know what I mean? Hmm, I never thought about it that way. No, that wasn't ever a motivation. So it's, it's just self-motivated. I just want to always know that I'm at my best. Was It really wasn't because I'm hoping to not get the criti criticism. That wasn't the reason. Well, I, I, I hate to harp on it so much, but it is such a big part of the film in that first. It's probably in the first 15 minutes. They're doing kind of a loop of things in pop culture where you've been made fun of, like Family Guy and South Park and the late great Norm MacDonald, who was one of my favorite Saturday Night Live. That's one of that made me laugh. I love the way he says it. It's great. I love crap. The way he says crap. <laughs> what does he say? Merry Christmas, Jesus. Hope you like crap. Merry I'm not saying you're crap, but, you know. <laughs> Uh, he was my favorite SNL anchor, actually. But what, you know, obviously you have a great sense of humor about this stuff. It, you know, it doesn't bother you. Are there any kind of like send ups, lampoons of you in pop culture, like Wayne's World's another one that you besides the sound the sound live one that you actually really enjoy that makes you laugh? Um, well, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the South Park was wonderful. I love the South Park. You know, I, I think I, what did I make the, I play a note that makes the world crap their pants or something. A certain note. <laughs> Is it the brown sound? The brown, the brown. No, the brown no. <laughs> I mean, that was, I'm so flattered that, that I'm on the radar of the, of South Park. I mean, I'm, I'm like a hero to my kids. Dad, man, you're featured on South Park. It's like awesome. <laughs> so great. I'm, I, I thought that was so funny. Um, a cartoonist sent me a, a drawing that he did. I don't know where it ever appeared, but it was a really funny. I, I still have it in my studio. And it's a picture, a uh, caricature of me in an elevator. The elevator operator is, has got his hands on the controls, but he's dozed off. And then you see on the speaker and you see music coming out of the speaker. And I'm in the elevator with holding my horn. You see my hair and I go, and my thought is, man, is this music cutting edge or what? So that's what I'm thinking. Elevator music is cutting edge music. And I thought that's so funny. And so, yeah, those make me laugh. They're they're very clever. You are kind of cutting edge now, though, because in the three part or whatever story arc of this film, you know, it, it begins with all of setting up the fact that, you know, you had all this derision. Then it kind of like there's that turnaround and then it ends with this renaissance you're having. And, uh, yeah. you know, it. which I mean, do you think like, you know, do you think your your time has come? Is the Kenny G renaissance fully afoot? You know, I think of like. Some other people I think of that sort of have had this is like Neil Diamond. Rick Astley is definitely having it right now. Um, I would say uh, Michael, uh, Michael Bolton, definitely. But, you know, someone who like at some point was kind of considered uncool. And then everyone thinks it's hip to be square. And you're like the coolest thing around. Are you feeling that right now? I am feeling that right now. I, I'm, I'm loving it. I think it's great. I, I just think and I've always thought if you're around long enough, I, I always think this quality is always going to rise to the top. So, you know, um, you know, if they want uh, a synthesized sound or some sort of a, a computer generated thing, okay, great. But do you want a real sound, like a real guy that can play a real instrument really well, and you want that, you want that on your record, then that's always gonna be a good thing. You know, you wanna, you wanna have Yo-Yo Ma on that cello, 
playing a beautiful solo or Wynton Marsalis on the trumpet playing, you know, you're going to get a quality thing. So you want me to play on, on your record? You're going to get a quality musician that knows how to play an instrument. This is real. This is a real, real playing. That's always going to be in style. It's always going to be around. It's always going to be sought after. You can't replace me with the with the computer generated sounds. Never going to happen. So I always thought, you know, it'll all it'll all work itself out. So when Kanye want, wanted me to do that thing for him, yeah, tell me how that came. About. That was crazy. When you're talking about when he, you know, when he was still married, obviously to Kim Kardashian, when he had you like serenade her for Valentine's Day, or. Yeah, I got messages uh, like the, just like at midnight that night before. Normally, I'm not even up. Normally, but I was actually up late that night, um, whatever I was doing. And I got messages. I go, wow, do I really want to wake up at eight, eight in the morning tomorrow on Valentine's Day and go over to see somebody I don't even know and do this? So I was trying to figure out, like, is this is this a good thing? Like I said in the in the film, I said, is it good or is it not good? Anyway, I did some checking and I decided to, to go for it. So, you know, after doing that and he brings me into the studio and starts playing me his music. And now like, oh, I'm gonna play on your record right now. And he goes, oh man, that'd be amazing. And I'm thinking, yeah, this is cool. I'm, I'm, I didn't feel out of place at all. I felt like, okay, I'm hearing your sound. In fact, when he was playing his music, I said to him, I gave him some ideas. He goes, right, he was telling his producers, write this down, these are great ideas. I was telling him what, what to do with some of his songs. like. You should do this with this guitar. You should do this with this. And by the way, that's for me. And he goes, great, do it. And he was super open to my suggestions. And anyway, he went in the studio probably four or five times. And all it was was just like a love fest, a love fest. Like he just loved everything I was doing. He thought I was, he goes, we should do a whole album together. So? I said, bro, I said, <laughs> you know, well, you know, <laughs> going to happen, it's, it's, giving me a scoop. It's a momentary, you know, uh, thing that feels good to say. But I mean, he, he was genuine and who knows, maybe we'll do another song or so, or so together. But it's that worked out really well. So, yeah, I'm feeling like the, the young guys are wanting maybe, maybe a little. I, I look at it like this. The young guys, maybe they want a little quality in their in their music. Not that they don't have quality, but I'm talking about a certain like mm -hmm. guy that's I mean, I've been around a long time and I'm I've honed my instrument. So I put myself in the, in the category of, of, a, of, you know, one of the guys that knows how to play. And there are lots of great musicians out there. Like I said, I mentioned that you got, you got your Wynton Marsalis, his brother, Branford Marsalis, a great sax player. There's lots of great players. And just get some of those iconic guys and go out there and play, have some real instruments. It's awesome. Now you're on like the weekends in your eyes, remix and stuff. Would, you know, and I'm a huge weekend fan. Would you say that the Kanye thing, or what, what would you say, is there one turning point where like, you know, this renaissance I'm talking about that sort of got it going? Was it the Kanye thing? Was it like the last Friday night Katy Perry video? What was it? Probably a lot of that. And also probably just me being on Instagram and doing kooky things that are catching people's attention. And so um, maybe I'm not, you know, disappearing from the woodwork. I'm actually kind of out there. So a lot of stuff, all of that together, the Kanye thing certainly helped a lot. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe because of that, you know, uh, the weekend called. I don't know. I don't know what, why I was on his radar, but I think it was mainly just because his he was doing a song that reminded him of the '80s. Yeah. Well, that it, sounds definitely coming back. Yeah, and it's coming back, and it's like, okay, if you want a sax solo from the '80s, okay, bro, <laughs> yeah, just give it to me. I, I, I got it. In fact, I when I I got the song, I said, can I said, do you want me to duplicate what you've already put down? Cause there was a sax part on there that was already down. I said, do you want me to duplicate that? Or can, can I just do my thing? He says, just do your thing. I said, cool. So I sent it to him and he, and he says, okay, I love everything about the solo except the, the, the first like four or five notes Two, It's too, you, you got to let it be a little bit. Uh, don't, don't do too many notes too fast. I want the first line to be more straight. I said, cool. Did that. I said, done. And then I saw him the next day because I, I, because he wanted me to come and do this thing with him live. I the, said, the award oh. show. It was, I think, the AMAs, right? No, we did that something else. before that. It was uh, oh, okay. the thing that he was getting an award for. And I said, okay, I'm going to work out the solo before we see each other and make sure you're happy with it because I don't want to surprise you. And so I worked it out. I sent it to him, and he goes, he loved it. So when I went there, I was like, I'm just going to play the solo that I worked out, and it's, it was, it was awesome. Really, really cool. I didn't 
realize it was going to sound so good live with his, him and his band. It was so fun. And he's such a good singer. He really is. I mean, oh, God, you know, yeah. I'm I mean, fan. but for real, like off camera, when he's singing, he's good. He's a great, great artist. He deserves his, his success. And he's a hard worker, too. So we had a lot of a uh, lot of things in common. We were both like I played my solo. I said, hey, bro, let me let me fix a couple of notes here. He goes, me too. Me too. I said, oh, wow. I met, I met my young Matt here. Hey, I do mean, you want it to be great? I want it to be great. Hey, this is going to work out really well. And the 80s were a great time for saxophones. We had all these people like, you know, we had Careless Whisper. We had Spandau Ballet. We had Men at Work. We had all these ska bands, you know, like it was a good time, you know, to in excess how to, you know, it was a good time. And there was you getting your start. I Unfortunately, I'm having such a great time talking to you, but I have to wrap it up. But you were talking about how you didn't feel um out of place being with Kanye and of course you shouldn't because you opened as we were talking about you opened for Miles Davis which I mean I just I need to ask one last follow-up question about how that came about and how his audience responded to you you were like kind of it looks like from the photo it was a long time ago you probably knew up and coming in the business well um I, I don't know how it came about to be honest with you some somehow it did obviously I'm sure Miles I had to sign off on it because it was his gig and um, the audience, they, they, you know, they always respond to when we do our thing They are, you know, I, I do my thing and people seem to enjoy it. So, yeah, I mean, it wasn't like his audience was not responsive and just waiting for him. So, yeah, you know, it's always been that way when I, when I do my opening act, when I used to open for Whitney Houston, those, those, the audience loved my concert was great with her and, People responded very well, and all it all it always seems to work out. I think the only time it didn't work out was when I went to Germany and I played on a talk show, and I opened on this talk show for a German band called Totenhosen. I've heard of them. And this was a, a this was I think they were like a metal sounding thing, and the audience was there for Totenhosen. And <laughs> as I'm playing my sweet little songbird, the audience goes into a chant: Totenhosen. Toten Hosen, and they just keep chanting over my sound. They're drowning me out, and I'm on this. I'm on this show, and I went, "Wow, this is a first. And I, I kind of like inside, I went, "This was a long way to come for this." And I looked at the guys in my band, and I gave them this special cue, which means we're going to end the song really quickly. So we ended the song quickly. I packed my sacks back in the case and drove right to the airport and flew back to L.A. All the oh, way from <laughs> Germany. <laughs> With all of this Kenny G renaissance that's happening, I feel like a, a good full circle moment that would have to be an addendum for like a director's cut of this film is I don't know if Tote and Hosen are still around, but I feel like you guys should collaborate together. You know, that would be actually at this point right now, Tote and Hosen <laughs> probably see, would say, hey, we'd be into that. And that would be a really cool. I would, if, if anyone knows them, you know, have them reach out to me and, um, that would be great. So, but before we go, we'll talk a little bit about my new record, New Standards. Yeah, it's interesting because in the film, you know, there's this part where they talk about when you did like the posthumous Louis Armstrong uh, yeah. duet, like a lot of people were very oh, blasphemous. Oh, yeah. And, but you were one of the first viral emails ever. So whatever, you're still in a moment in pop culture history. There from you go. that. Yeah. So that's the positive spin. But now you're sort of doing a thing where you're reinterpreting jazz classics, right? New Standards. And I'm imagining if you're setting yourself up for a yeah. little more, uh, you know, targeting, I guess. I guess you don't really care. I, 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 did, I did a posthumous duet with Stan Getz on the new record. And so oh, Stan wow. Getz and I are, are doing a, a cool collaborative thing that I created. And, oh boy, I mean, they're, they're going to have a field day with this one. But the actual <laughs> album, I'm, it, and it's a beautiful song. The whole album is basically jazz ballads of the 50s and 60s, but not not jazz ballads of the 50s and 60s. It's the sound of that, the vibe of that, but I wrote all the songs. They're all new compositions. And I think I played it in a way that I had always envisioned that vibe. And I, I think it's super romantic. It's beautiful. It's sophisticated. It's very jazzy. It's more like straight ahead jazzy vibe than my past records. Oh. So I'm really psyched about it. It's, I think it's absolutely beautiful. And I kind of feel like maybe in 2021, you know, given the happy ending of listening to Kenny G, perhaps this record will be better received than it would have been had you released it 10 or 20 or 
so years ago. Perhaps this is the moment where people will kind of get it. I'm thinking you're right about that. I feel this is always, this is going to be the right time. Uh, if you, everything feels good uh, with the HBO special coming out in December, record coming out in December, it just feels great to me. It feels like, uh, yeah, it feels like I'm kind of back doing what I was doing, you know, 30 years ago. And here we go. Let's go. Let's go again. I'm ready. I've got the energy. Let's do it. Come on, Totenhosen. Get on board. <laughs> well, it was wonderful to speak with you. Congratulations on everything you got going on. I'll see you on Twitter or Instagram. And uh, I'm looking forward to, you know, maybe getting some Starbucks with you, getting some coffee with you someday. Thank you very much. Appreciate the support on that, too.